scary. Uh, and Kwame Brown, you know, he was a, a bust by the standards of being the number one overall pick, but he did play 12 years in the league. That's good. And that's no easy feat. Uh, so he took to uh, make a little video while he was driving around about uh, woke black Democrats. Listen to this riff. Pretty good stuff. I got people calling my phone all the time. I got, the, I don't know how the hell all these people get my number, the Democrats registry and all this shit. Are you voting for Joe Biden? I say, well, what is his policy? Like, He's going to let you know after the, uh, you can go online. I, I, I went online. I saw the tax plan. I saw this. I saw that. I don't know for black America. What's going on? Oh, we gonna talk about... Oh, no, I ain't... Uh, uh, till I hear the debate, I'll call you back. Like, I don't want to hear that shit. I'm not one of them scared Negroes. I'm me. I'm, uh, get on the line and try to talk all smart. Oh, well, you know, I went to school and I would... Oh, yeah, you did. You went to school and all that. Okay, yeah. You've been voting for the Democrats this whole time. Uh, so have I and everybody else. And what do we have to show for it? Well, you know, they're trying to combat racism. Well, why the f*** they ain't do it in 60 years then? Well, you know, we're still working on it. Man, I don't want to hear that sh**. I don't want to hear it. I'm up to here with all these excuses that people make. I I'm just so tired. You fake woke Negroes, man. Y'all are the worst thing to the black community. You fake woke because you fake woke won't allow independent thought. Because I don't care who you vote for. I ain't never cussed nobody out for voting for the Democratic Party. I ain't never called nobody a coon or a disrespectful name. None of that. You motherfuckers, uh, you, you guys that, that do that, not all Democrats do that, but the guys who do that, y'all are the new version of the KKK. The white folks don't got to do nothing. Y'all are the new version of the KKK because you try to intimidate, you try to exile black folks and you try to cancel them because they don't agree with you and that's sad you act like you're doing something righteous for doing that the democratic party is our people so you gonna hurt another black man for the white people that you like you a fool Kwame brown seems to have it pretty well sussed out uh let's get uh view from our friend Bob Woodson, the founder and president of the Woodson Center and author of the recently released Red, White and Black, Rescuing American History from Revisionists and Race Hustlers, which I saw uh, at the top of the list in Amazon uh, on Amazon this week, Bob. So that's uh, great that you're strong out of the gate with that new collection of essays. Welcome. Yeah, I'm pleased to be here. Uh, but no, it is. It's, it's, it's tracking number one. Uh, Jason Riley has a real powerful column in the Wall Street Journal today talking about the book. And uh, so we, we think it's going to continue to soar. There's a thirst for truth out there. There's as, as, as a thirst for what Kwame was saying, too. Uh, I have found in recent way, days when the, the, the few instances when the other side will debate, like I, I, I debated Hawk Newman, the founder of uh, Black Lives Matter in New York, and I think he got stumped when I said, well, if racism is the, is the culprit, then why have blacks, low-income blacks failed for 50 years in cities run by their own people, in systems run by their own school systems? Blacks in Baltimore and Cleveland and other cities, their mayors, the city council, chief of police, hospitals, the prisons, everything. And explain to me then if racism, racism is the culprit, then why are blacks? Failing in systems run by their own people, and it stumps them. They they they, they don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Well, in your book, you know, you talk about the United States was founded, yes or no, as a racist nation. That's that's what the other side alleges. Right, that's what the that's other what side the is other right, side and you're disputing says. that in your book. And how how do you go through that? Well, because it's it's no, it's, it's it's defined uh, racism. I mean. Slavery is America's birth defect. No one should be defined by the worst of what we've ever done in our past. America is defined by its promise. We are the only nation that has a, do a declaration of, uh, of the only nation that has an Emancipation Proclamation. We're the only nation in the world that fought a war to end slavery. And so, uh, and so in our essays, we talk about, we debunk this whole notion that Many of the problems confronting black America today in our urban centers 
violence out of wedlock births is related to the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow is just not true. And we get evidence of the fact that even in, uh, in the era of Jim Crow, we built hotels, we built hospitals, 100 colleges and universities. And so there is uh, a rich uh, history of achieving in the presence of oppressive circumstances. So we, and so this is what we want America needs to, to understand, that black America is never defined by slavery or Jim Crow. We're defined by America's promise. America is a, is a, is a nation of second chances. It's a nation of redemption. So we need to tell a more complete story of, of, of black history. I, I am seeing more evidence of that thirst for understanding that you were describing at the outset. Uh, w- one example of this is this uh, parent, Andrew Gutman, who uh, wrote an essay about critical race theory being taught at his daughter's elite New York City private school, Brearley, uh, that went viral, like that, uh, that math teacher whose essay went viral uh, as well, another New York private school where he basically said, look, I, I'm not going to treat my students differently based on the race, and that's what I'm being asked to do. This guy, Andrew Gutman, who's a former investment banker, wrote in The Hill, since my letter became public, I've received several thousand supportive emails and messages from people across the country, including many from self-described Democrats and liberals. The tone of most of the messages sent to me is not at all political in nature. Instead, the tenor is one of desperation and powerlessness. I thought that was an interesting observation because... Uh, as he was trying to debunk this notion that uh, the opposition to this race hustle, uh, critical race theory, is, is just coming from conservatives or just coming from the right. And what he's saying is that's not true. It isn't. Well, the polls bear this, bear this out. Eighty percent of black Americans polled are opposed to defund the police. But yet you see the vilification of police, even by uh, 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 Michelle Obama. I was just. Uh, uh, out, outrage, but here she is sitting in an ABC interview talking about she's fearful of her daughters riding in a car. Is this, <laughs> you know, as, as she she hasn't touched the as, as Candace Owens says she hasn't touched a doorknob in twelve years. Uh, <laughs> and so who is she? I want to see if, if she really believes that that we should defund the police and she should give up Secret Service protection. Yep. I want to see some of these progressives, you know, be true to their principles and be willing to suffer the consequence of their advocacy by giving up their protection. Well, they're too busy rallying to the defense of Nicole Hannah-Jones, Bob. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, uh, who has had her appointment uh, to a tenured position uh, at University of North Carolina, blocked for the moment, is uh, the subject of a, a letter signed by luminaries, including ta Coates, we stand in solidarity with Nicole Hand uh, Jones. The 6019 Project uh, is, uh, uh, as they describe, a landmark exploration of America's deep roots in enslavement. And uh, this is an example denying Nicole Hannah Jones' tenure of anti democratic, small d, oppression on college campuses. You, you know, and what they used to help deny it, thank God they did was the fact that when somebody asked her one time whether or not the violence that she's witnessing around the country, someone said it's a 1619 violence. She said, well, I'm not ashamed to be associated with that. Right. Right. You know, and and she didn't walk that back. Well, she also said she 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 referred to uh, smash and grabs to looting as symbolic taking another redefinition. Exactly. And I think, uh, you know, I'm hoping that white folks, man, will, will get experience race fatigue. If not, I got certified as a racial exorcist. So <laughs> hey, I'm going to get it on the race up for myself. The Ed and Lorraine Warren uh, of uh, racial exorcism. Um, yeah, I, I got I got self-certified as a racial exorcist. The, uh, so when I, I speak before a white audience, if all the guilty white people, if you get a surge of white guilt, all you got to do is remember Bob Woodson 
exorcise me. Uh, I'll, send them a little, I'll send them a, a uh, certificate if they pay me twenty five dollars. Listen, Dan, I got to get in on this hustle, man. Yeah, right, right. Exactly. No, hey, that's and that's get you know, garlic. and compared to the uh, hourly fees they're charging for the uh, critical race theory seminars, that's very reasonable. Uh, twenty five dollars. I think so too. I just I think I'm going to underprice them. <laughs> so, Mr. Woodson, yesterday was the one year anniversary of the the death of George Floyd and. Does it bother you that some people in certain social circles are considering him like a civil rights icon? I mean, there's a, 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 a George Floyd uh, Federation, uh, a George Floyd Square. I mean, they're treating him like he's Rosa Parks. Right. He was a thug who resisted arrest. I think it's unfortunate that he died, but he's no martyr. And this tells you just how how much we have descended in terms of off the moral uh, plane to 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 lionize and treat as a, a social martyr a George Floyd, and and you notice that the violence that is occurring in his name in Portland, Oregon, is that has not been condemned by the people who are supporting him. That has not been condemned. It, where do you think? I mean, speaking of the the one year, but it's it's so much more than that, but. You know, you're optimistic by nature. I'm less so. Where do you see this battle about America's history that you and your colleagues and many scholars and and doers are engaged in? Give us an assessment of where the battle stands right now across all of America's civic, cultural, and educational institutions. The way it stands, I just think that there is a silent majority in black America and all over this nation that is waiting um, uh, for the spark to ignite a kind of a moral brush fire that's going to just push back the very fact that our book is tracking number one. um, And and I'm getting all kinds of calls. I believe we had 16 black children murdered under the age of 14 murdered since George Floyd's death, 16 of them, 11 month old in Syracuse, New York, uh, a four year old at his birthday party in, in Florida. Yet that doesn't matter. And people are going to push back against that. And what we're doing at the Woodson Center by we want to deracialize race and just take it out because it's preventing us from addressing the deeper problem confronting this country. And that's the moral and spiritual freefall that is causing the uh, teenagers, uh, young people in black America, homicide is the leading cause of death in Appalachia and uh, low-income whites is, is pharmaceutical uh, uh, drugs. Uh, and, and then upper income groups like in Silicon Valley, the leading cause of death is suicide. It's six times the national average. What we want to do at the Woodson Center is we want to bring representatives of those groups together, those moms together who have suffered the loss of children because kids feel as if their life has no meaning or content. If you don't believe life has content or meaning, then you'll take someone else's or you'll take your own. And so this is the deeper problem that we need to be addressing, and the Woodson Center hopes to be able to be a force to bring people together uh, so that we can find solutions to that, that pain that is in the hearts of our children. So, and there are other problems like that we need to be addressed, but we can't do it if we are polarized into ra- racial tribes and forever having to confront this a false barrier that is keeping us from uniting as, as, as Americans. In Jason Riley's column in the Wall Street Journal, he writes, the 1619 Project is not an intellectual exercise in search of truth. It's a political exercise in search of power. More scholars could and should be calling out this false history, but let's be grateful to the ones who have risen to the occasion. And those who have risen to the occasion include Bob Woodson and all of those who uh, contributed essays to his new book, Red, White, and Black, Rescuing American History from Revisionists and Race Hustlers. Uh, Pick up that book. Keep it number one on Amazon. Support the Woodson Center. Bob Woodson, thanks so much for joining us as always. And thank you so much. Thank you. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. You've made the switch, and it feels so good. You've switched to Chicago's Morning Answer on AM 560. 
The Answer. The Lou Dobbs Financial Report is brought to you by Signature Bank, helping local businesses succeed. Visit SignatureBank.Bank for your... 